I'll speak about that and more with Senator Rand Paul. And our correspondents and specialists are also standing by with full coverage. But let's begin with the president's very broad hint about a possible pardon. Up first, our CNN White House correspondent, Caitlin Collins. Caitlin, this is quite a bombshell. Take us through the president's thinking, what he said. Well, Wolf, the president is now refusing to rule out a pardon for Paul Manafort, saying, why should I take it off the table during an interview with the New York Post? And that comes after months of the president refusing to answer reporters' questions about whether or not he was considering pardoning his former campaign chairman. And it also comes after months of the president distancing himself from Paul Manafort, saying that despite the fact that he ran his campaign for several months, he only worked for him for a short period of time, and the president didn't know him that well. Wolf, what's changed is now that the special counsel is saying that Paul Manafort lied repeatedly to them after he agreed to a plea deal with them, and now they are saying he has breached that agreement, and the president is now willing to go on the record and say that he's not going to take a, a pardon for his former campaign chairman off the table, telling the New York Post this in a quote that it was never discussed, but I wouldn't take it off the table. Why would I take it off the table? Well, if we do know that the president has discussed these pardons with his lawyers, whether or not he brought it up or his lawyers brought it up is still unclear, uh, but it is something that has been discussed. And this does come one day after the press secretary, Sarah Sanders, said that there was no discussion of any pardons related to the Russia investigation happening in the West Wing. That seems to have changed. Another quote the president gave to the New York Post is he was talking about flipping, cooperating with the government, which over the summer he said he believed should be illegal when it was first reported that there could be several people flip on him and give information to the government. And now he's telling the New York Post, you know, this flipping stuff is terrible. You flip and you lie and you get the prosecutors will tell you 99 percent of the time they can get people to flip. It's rare that they can't. In this interview, Wolf, he praised Roger Stone, Jerome Corsi, and Paul Manafort, saying that he believed they were brave people for not flipping and cooperating with the special counsel, though it's still unclear what it is Paul Manafort told the special counsel and what he lied to them about, according to that court filing from earlier this week. Now, Wolf, the president was also stewing in this interview, talking about the Mueller investigation and also threatening to declassify documents that he believes will be devastating to Democrats. He gave this quote to the New York Post about that, saying that he believed uh, if they want to play tough, I will do it. He said, quote, they will see how devastating those pages are. Now, that will be welcome news to some very conservative uh, people on Capitol Hill, but this is something the president had refused to do uh, earlier on in, in this fall, but now it seems to be that is back on the table, Wolf. And this all comes as the president is continuing to lash out at the special counsel this week, the third day in a row that he has been blasting him on Twitter, first thing when he wakes up, uh, saying that he's highly conflicted, going after the people on his team. And then today, he stunned people when he tweeted out this image. It was a retweet, an image of several of his political opponents, not including, uh, or not limited to, but also including Barack Obama, John Podesta, Hillary Clinton, Huma Abedin, several other people in this figure. But Wolf, the two that stand out is the one at the top left, Robert Mueller, and the one to the right of Robert Mueller, and that is the president's hand-picked Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. He is implying essentially that he is behind bars, and of course the quote reads, now that Russia collusion is a proven lie, when do the trials begin? Wolf, the president seems to be accusing his own deputy attorney general, who is currently serving in his administration, recently flew with him on Air Force One, and is often behind these doors in the West Wing of committing treason. Yeah, I just want to be precise. Uh, that quote uh, that the president retweeted with that image of those 11 people, uh, now that the Russia collusion is a proven lie, when do the trials for treason begin? Uh, the word treason is included in that retweet by the president, uh, Art Caitlin. Thank you very, very much. Uh, let's uh, bring in our senior justice correspondent, Evan Perez, and our chief political correspondent, Dana Bash. Evan, the president's uh, suggestion that a pardon is now not necessarily off the table. That raises all sorts of questions. Right, Wolf. And uh, look, this is something that the president's legal team has repeatedly told, told him uh, and counseled him to avoid talking about, simply because you don't want to provide additional uh, ammunition to Robert Mueller and his investigators who already are looking into whether or not the, the president uh, committed any obstruction of justice. And so 
this is the kind of thing that, you, you know, if you're in the Mueller team, you're, you're simply printing out these tweets, you're printing out these, uh, these media interviews that the president has given, and you're adding it to your obstruction file. Now, the president has unequal uh, pardon power. He, th his power is without, you know, an anybody can check it, right? Um, and so what we don't know, Wolf, is whether or not these, these comments and these statements really add up to obstruction or whether this is something that uh, the Mueller team can say uh, shows his state of mind uh, as he's, you know, as, as he's reacting to this investigation. And, and Evan's talking about it from the perspective of Mueller and the legal perspective. There's also, of course, the political perspective, which could turn into a legal uh, issue, which is the United States Congress. Right. Um, you already have uh, the top senators like uh, Mark Warner, the top Democrat on the Intelligence Committee, tweeting out uh, that this is absolutely, you know, absurd. I'm paraphrasing now. Not to mention the fact that you have an incoming House in January where Democrats are going to be in control. And these are potential real issues. Of course, the president can pardon right. whomever he wants. That's, that's the Constitution. But as part of this, of this investigation, to do it at this time, it's hard to imagine, even to talk about it, it's hard to imagine right. that the House Democrats who now have, right, now have the gavel and subpoena power won't look into that. And what the president has done by retweeting this image of these 11 former officials, including two former presidents, with the words, and I'll read it one more time, now that Russia collusion is a proven lie, when do the trials for treason begin? He's got these 11 individuals, including his former, uh, including his own Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein and Mueller behind Barr's two former presidents. That, that's so shocking to see a president of the United States go after political rivals, but others, including former CIA directors, two former attorneys general, uh, and, and two former presidents behind bars. Look, I, I think going to the, to the politics of this, I think the president is, is, there's an angle here, and that is to undermine whatever this investigation is going to come out. They, they, the president is concerned about whatever Mueller is going to come out with with his report. Um, and I think what he wants to make sure is he can soften some of the public. Uh, he knows he's got his base uh, behind him, but he wants people who are maybe more in the middle to know that whatever Mueller tells you is not going to be the truth. And so this is part of a political strategy that has been going on Absolutely. simply, you know, for, for the better part of the year. We see, we see it from Rudy Giuliani, we see it from the president, and we don't know whether, whether it will work or not, but it is, it is a strategy. And he's also, in this remarkable interview in the New York Post, he's threatening Democrats who are about to be the majority in the House of Representatives, warning them, if you go after me, if you investigate me, he's, he's saying, uh, I will declassify documents that will be devastating to the Democrats. If they, if they want to go and harass the president and the administration, I think that would be the best thing that could happen to me because I'm a counterpuncher and I will hit them so hard they've never been hit like that. Uh, that's what the President of the United States is threatening the new Democratic mm -hmm. incoming majority in the House of Representatives. Right, and it's in keeping with other sort of kinds of threats that we've heard from the President to use levers of the United States government that are not supposed to be used uh, for political retribution to do exactly that. And this all speaks to his mindset. What he tweeted uh, in that, what he said in the interview, what he's been doing all week long, he is upset, he's angry, and he, that's why he, frankly, probably answered the question the way he did right. on the pardon issue, even though, as Evan has heard, and as I have as well, his lawyers have been begging him not to do that for the reasons we've been discussing. And all this comes, Dan, as, as you uh, and others at CNN have now, for the first time, learned of some of the answers, the formal answers he provided to Robert Mueller the other day. That's right. We uh, are a part of the team. They're getting the first insight, really, Wolf, into how the president responded to Robert Mueller's written questions. Until now, it's really been a big, big unknown, but sources familiar with the matter tell us two things. Number one, that the president told the special counsel that Roger Stone did not tell him about WikiLeaks. And number two, that the president was also not told about the 2016 Trump Tower meeting between his son, campaign officials, and a Russian lawyer who promised dirt on Hillary Clinton. Now, the president's answers were described to us without providing any direct quotes and said that the president made clear in answering that he was doing so to the best of his recollection. But, Wolf, these two key points, WikiLeaks, the Trump Tower meeting, they're really central to what was at the core of Robert Mueller's mission at the beginning, which was, was there collusion between anybody in Trump world, from the candidate, now president, on down, 
and the Russians. And now that he's uh, put it in writing and submitted uh, the written answers to the written questions from Robert Mueller, it, it, it adds a new layer of potential concern. It, it sure does. Look, we are told, I should say, that the president, uh, what he told in writing to the Mueller team matches, at least on these two issues, what he has said in public. But there is a big difference, and that is the significance to the answers in writing are monumental because they will be subject to criminal charges if proven false. That's why it's our understanding, Wolf, that the lawyers, which is pretty typical in this case, right. put you know some caveats to my recollection, uh, as far as I recall, in here in case his recollections should be challenged. Very legalese, uh, all right, guys. Excellent reporting to both of you. Thanks so much. Thank you uh, for that. Uh, let's uh, bring in uh, Republican Senator Rand Paul right now of Kentucky. He's a key member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Senator, thanks for your patience. Thanks very much for joining us. Lots of news, as you can see, unfolding right now. Let me get your reaction to the breaking news. The president now says he's not taking the prospect of a pardon for Paul Manafort off the table. Uh, what's your, what's your reaction to that? You know, I don't have any particular insight into the president, whether he'll offer pardons or not offer pardons to people. I do think in general, though, that the idea of special prosecutors is a bad one. And the reason I say this is that typically in our justice system, someone commits a crime and we go after a crime and we find out who committed a crime. What a special prosecutor does is go after a person and look for a crime, and we let the prosecutor troll back through a person's entire life history. And I think it's too much power. It gives the government too much power to prosecute people. And I think we could prosecute tens of thousands of people if we appointed special prosecutors. So I'm really not a fan of this, and I think it's a distortion of justice. So I'm for the Mueller investigation to end as soon as possible. And uh, if there's something out there, let's hear about it. But I think they've gone on long enough. But, do, but you don't believe there should have been any rush investigation into Russian meddling in the U.S. presidential election? I think there should be, and there has been, but I don't think that doing it through a special prosecutor is the way to do it. We have ways to investigate crime in our country. We have ways to investigate things, even when they have to be done secretly in court. But I think that uh, doing it with a special prosecutor gives too much power to one person to go astray. For example, Manafort will be prosecuted for something really that had nothing to do with any kind of Russian collusion, nothing to do with Trump or the campaign. So the mandate seems to have been investigate things that happened between, you know, during the Trump Trump campaign, and yet he'll be investigated and prosecuted and has been on something totally unrelated. So I think you give too much power to prosecutors. They can look back through a lot of people's history and grab up and say, well, you didn't file this paperwork correctly. You didn't file to be a foreign lobbyist. You did this and that. And I'm not excusing his behavior, but I'm just saying that that's not really the way our justice system is supposed to work. Our justice system is supposed to say this crime happened, who committed it, and not say, hey, let's go look at this person and see if we can find a crime. You think uh Mueller uh, would view a Manafort pardon by the president as obstruction of justice. I, I don't even know how to answer that because I think the president has the ability to pardon whoever he wants to. I just have no particular insight into whether he will or won't or what process he'll go through in determining that. The president uh, also says that the special counsel's team is forcing witnesses to lie. Uh, he really seems to be rattled by the ongoing uh, investigation. And as you saw, he retweeted this awful picture showing two former presidents, the current deputy attorney general, the special counsel, Robert Mueller, among others. And he says, when do the trials for treason begin? Is that appropriate for a president of the United States? I really haven't seen a lot of that today because I've been busy trying to stop the war in Yemen. And so I think we've had a big day here on in the Senate, you know, having, a, I think, a, an historic vote on whether or not we should still be at war in Yemen and whether or not Congress should have a say-so before the president does. I just really haven't had time to, you know, go through all of the things the president says every day about the Mueller investigation. I know that y'all get so involved in it, but really the, the rest of life goes on in the, in the Capitol of trying to discuss war and peace and whether we should be at war in Yemen, I think, is a, is dwarfs any yeah. of the sort of the other things that we might want to talk well, about. We're going to talk about Yemen. We're going to talk about Saudi Arabia in a moment. But, but quickly, on the president telling the New York Post he's prepared to declassify what he calls devastating documents in order to hurt Democrats if they go ahead and engage in investigation of him when they're the majority in the House of Representatives. Do you believe that would be an abuse of, uh, of his power to declassify? You know, the whole classification thing is, is so uh, screwed up. We classify everything up here. I don't think it should be done for vindictive purposes, but I do believe that we way over-classify things and a lot of things should be declassified. And I'll give you an example. 
the, the newspapers have reported that the CIA concluded that the Crown Prince MBS was involved and directed the killing of, of Khashoggi, the dissident. Um, that's somehow been classified and was leaked to a newspaper and now is out there in the open. I don't think that should be classified. I don't think it should be kept to a select group of people because the rest of us, the, the rest of the representative democracy, we should debate whether or not if that is the CIA's conclusion. See, no one's told me that. I haven't been told that. I've read about in the newspaper, but no one else is really denying it. But really, all of Congress should know about that. And really, the American people should know if the CIA concluded that the crown prince was involved and directed the killing of this dissident, this American, uh, this person who was living in America, I think, by golly, we ought to all know about that because that would inform our debate, but that's classified. So I think we classify things, too many things, and I think the more sunlight, the better all around. The uh, Secretary of State, uh, Mike Pompeo, says there's no direct reporting that the Saudi crown prince ordered uh, the killing of Khashoggi. The Defense Secretary, uh, General Mattis, says uh, there's no smoking gun. Uh, you said the evidence of the crown prince's involvement is, in your word, overwhelming. Why don't the uh, president and these other top officials necessarily agree with you? I think what's been going on for a long time in American foreign policy is that we're so used to supporting the lesser of two evils that we look the other way when evil happens. I think the evil that occurred to Mr. Khashoggi was so barbaric that people are having trouble looking away. And this administration is doing what every administration has done for the last decade after decade. They look away when it's their guy. How many times throughout the Cold War did we choose one evil dictator over another one if they were pro-American versus pro-Soviet? This is just another example of it. So this is not something abrupt with the Trump administration. This is actually a continuation of the norm in Washington, and that is to excuse bad behavior. But I will tell you, today the Senate woke up and the Senate says, hey, we're not going to keep blindly supporting Saudi Arabia, and we're not going to keep blindly supporting the war in Yemen. Today was a big day. Uh, I want to get to that vote in a moment, but Gina Haspel, the CIA director, she wasn't up on uh, Capitol Hill meeting with senators today as Mattis was uh, a a and Pompeo was. Was that a mistake? Why didn't they, they let her go up there and brief you guys? I think it was a mistake, and I think it's interesting in that the one thing that's out there in the media is that the CIA concluded with high probability that the crown prince was involved. And so that conclusion is being completely sloughed over and people are turning a blind eye to that and yet she's the one that could confirm or deny that that CIA report exists and yet the only way we're hearing about this is through the media because our government's not letting us know the truth and this is something I've argued for a long time intelligence information like this is restricted to eight people in Congress the elite eight get to hear about this a rank-and-file senator I represent an entire state they will not tell me or they haven't told us you know, whether the CIA has issued this report. And so the thing is, is that we shouldn't have to read about this in the media. And the only reason it came forward and may or may not have been discussed further since then is because we heard about it in the media. You and your fellow senators have just voted in a very impressive vote to advance a resolution, uh, Senator, to end the U.S. involvement in the war in Yemen. The vote uh, was 63 to 37, bipartisan support. Uh, did today's briefing the overall handling by the administration of the Khashoggi murder, did that influence that successful vote today? I think so, because we've had similar votes in the past and they've failed, and now we gained about 10 or 15 new votes today. But the reason why this is historic is that our founding fathers wanted Congress to declare war, not the president. Very specifically, they said, Congress, not the president, shall declare war. So this vote today is the Senate, part of Congress, taking back that power from the presidency and saying, you do not get to unilaterally decide whether or not we will support Saudi Arabia in a war in Yemen. That is a vote of Congress. So this is a huge day for constitutional separation of powers and for Congress being a check and a balance on the administration. And I've been fair on this. I've been very ecumenical. When it was President Obama, I voted the same way to say he shouldn't have gone and bombed in Libya without our permission as well. So this is a big day for checks and balances and what Ma Madison would be proud of us today. You've been generous with your time. One final question before I let you go, Senator. The White House hasn't uh, ruled out the possibility of an informal interaction, a meeting between President Trump and the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman at the G20 summit in Buenos Aires Friday or Saturday. Uh, do you think the two, these two leaders should meet? 
I think it's a mistake, and I think the message we should send to them is that we want to deal with someone who's not ordering the murder of dissidents. We want to meet with someone who's not ordering the blockade of a fellow Middle Eastern country cutter. We want to meet with someone who isn't exacerbating a war on civilians in Yemen. And I think the only way they get that message is if we quit selling them arms. So meeting with them sends the wrong message. There are also other dissidents. There's a young man by the name of Barik al nimr He was 17 when he was picked up at a protest rally. His uncle has already been executed. He's on death row. He will be crucified and beheaded in Saudi Arabia. If we say it's okay to kill Khashoggi, they're going to say, hey, the Americans don't care much if we kill our dissidents, and then we're going to kill this young man also. So this young man's life hangs in the balance. If we look away on Khashoggi's killing, there will be more death in Saudi Arabia. More dissidents will be killed. Uh, Senator, thanks so much uh, for joining us. Thanks, by the way, also for supporting a free press, something very close yeah. to all of our hearts. Appreciate it very Thank much. You. Up next uh, are the president's.